Good evening and welcome to Tucker Carlson tonight. For more than a hundred years, the Democratic Party was organized around the interests of ordinary Americans. Democrats ran campaigns on things like higher wages, better working conditions against the banks that crushed their voters with debt. A lot of Democratic ideas didn't always work. Some were silly, but their focus was always clear. American citizens were the party's priority, and that is no longer the case. To the modern Democratic Party, Americans are an afterthought. Try to find a Democrat running this year, for example, on the opioid crisis or high energy prices, the collapse of public schools, the decline of the middle class. Hard to find one. Democrats are bored by these topics. What interests them is power. In order to win and maintain power, Democrats understand they need reliable new voters, voters who will support them obediently without making difficult demands like a higher standard of living. That's why the Democratic Party suddenly supports open borders so fervently. Immigration is really the only issue that matters to them because packing the electorate is the only way they can regain control of this country. Their goal is clear, and they will do or say anything to achieve it. Here, for example, is the governor of New York likening the Trump administration to Islamic terrorists for the crime of daring to enforce federal immigration law. Watch. They are on a jihad to deport as many people as they can who they believe are not in the United States legally. Who they believe are not in the United States legally. Pretty easy to determine whether someone's here legally or not. And it wasn't that long ago that leading Democrats like Bill Clinton, for example, argued in public that our country should deport illegal immigrants. They're here illegally, after all. They're breaking our law. Now, Democrats claim that non-citizens, even illegal ones, have a right to vote in our elections. That is happening in San Francisco and in parts of the state of Maryland. By the 2020 election, it'll be happening in many other places. That's guaranteed. Now, you'd think congressional Republicans would be upset about this. Allowing illegals to occupy and run our country makes a mockery of citizenship. It's terrible for America, and it's a death sentence for the Republican Party. But nope. Republicans on the Hill seem okay with this. Here's one example. In 2014, the Obama administration changed the rules so that anybody claiming a threat from gang violence or domestic abuse could get asylum in the United States. The effect was to allow pretty much anybody to permanently enter this country provided they supplied the right story. And many, many did. Of course, that was precisely the point, to open the borders without saying so. Well, earlier this summer, Attorney General Jeff Sessions reversed the Obama rule. Now House Republicans somehow, for some reason, are teaming up with Democrats to stop Sessions from doing that. Just yesterday, they tacked an amendment onto an appropriations bill in the House that would preserve the asylum rights of anybody who claims to be fleeing gang violence. That change would nullify any effort to secure our southern border. Mexico and Central America have plenty of gang violence. Now, all 150 million people who live there can cite that fact as justification to move here legally and stay permanently. When they get here, they'll find Democrats eager to give them the right to vote. House Republicans could stop this. They're not even trying. One person who thinks Republicans ought to care about this issue is former House Speaker Newt Gingrich. He just wrote a piece about the left's plan to win through non-citizen voting. We spoke with him just a short time ago. Here's what he said. Mr. Speaker, thanks for joining us tonight. You've argued that the entire point of the Democrats' immigration policy is to increase their electoral share. How do you think this works? Well, it's pretty straightforward. Uh, they think they get the vast majority of votes from illegal immigrants in San Francisco. They've now made it possible to vote without being a citizen. Uh, there are other places around the country where Democrats are advocating that they allow people who are not here legally or people who have not yet become citizens to vote. And I think they think their calculus is that uh, they have a harder time winning an election with law-abiding Americans. And so the more people they can bring in who don't know American history, don't understand the Constitution, aren't part of uh, our traditional values, the better off their chances are. I think that's why Every single Democratic senator co-sponsored Senator Feinstein's open border bill, which would literally have opened the border for virtually everybody in the world uh, to come to America. When you were speaker, there are about 22 million foreign born people in the United States. That number is now about double. Republicans have controlled the Congress for a lot of that time. Even today, Republicans on the Hill 
are trying to undo the attorney gen one of the attorney general's efforts to, to tighten the border. Why don't Republicans on the Hill understand the threat that these policies pose to the country and to them? I frankly don't I don't get it. I mean, let's let's start with sanctuary cities, which is the most popular position uh, that President Trump has. Eighty four percent of the country, uh, eight out of every 10 Americans believes that sanctuary cities increase the risk of crime. Now, that should be pretty easy for Republicans and frankly, for common sense Democrats to unify around in terms of establishing a public policy. But I think part of what's happened is you have the constant drumbeat of the liberal media uh, which intimidates some Republicans who, who forget, and I re recently wrote a paper on this, um, the weakest Republican position on immigration is 60 percent. That's absolute control of the border. The strongest is 84 percent. That's closing down all the sanctuary cities, and in the case of California, closing down the sanctuary state. Yet Republicans often behave as though they represent a minority interest when in fact, even most people who are here as, as, as immigrants would like to see a law-abiding country that's physically safe. The Republican Party won't exist as a national party at this rate fairly soon. So a lot of members I know on the Hill can do math pretty well, but they, they don't understand that calculation. Well, I, I, I think somehow they lose their nerve. I mean, uh, when, you, when the drum beat all day, every day from the New York Times and the Washington Post and various liberal media, uh, the drum beat's constant. And if you are in favor uh, of uh, controlling the American border, uh, as I am, I'm, look, I'm in favor of legal immigration. I can tell you that I even voted in 1986 for the simpson Mazzoli Act, which did have amnesty, which promised us control of the border. Uh, Ronald Reagan signed it reluctantly and wrote in his memoir, there is diary, that the only reason he did it was to get control of the border. The Congress broke its word. We had <clears throat> 10 times as many people uh, come in under amnesty, as we were told, 3 million instead of 300,000. And then the President Reagan didn't get the things he'd been promised, which were a working a work permit system and control of the border. So ever since, I've been very skeptical. <clears throat> There's a large part of the national elite that for some reason loves immigration of any kind, dislikes controlling the border under any circumstance, and routinely smears people. Uh, if, if you say I'm for legal immigration, but I'm against people crossing the border illegally, somehow that becomes a, a xenophobic anti-foreigner, even though you're for legal immigration. Right. Well, you're attacking their housekeeper. They've imported an entire surf class to serve them, and they resent any, any efforts to restrain it. Mr. Speaker, thank you very much. Great to see you tonight. Thank you. Most of us grew up learning that the American Constitution, our Constitution, guarantees birthright citizenship. In other words, anybody born in this country, even to parents who are here illegally or simply on vacation, is a U.S. citizen and do all the benefits of that for life. But is that really what the Constitution says? Michael Anton does not believe it says that. He's a lecturer at Hillsdale College and a former Trump advisor who just wrote a piece in the Washington Post arguing that birthright citizenship is not a constitutional requirement. Michael Anton joins us tonight. Michael, thanks a lot for coming on. I'm Thank amazed the Post me. printed this piece. Good for them. You took a lot of heat for it. People were shocked by the idea that you would even question this. But you made your case partly on legal grounds. Why does the Constitution not say what we've been taught it says? Well, you have to read the whole 14th Amendment. It says there's a clause in the middle that people ignore or they misinterpret, subject to the jurisdiction thereof, thereof meaning of the United States. What they're saying is, if you're born on U.S. soil subject to the jurisdiction of the United States, meaning you're the child of citizens or the child of legal immigrants, then you are entitled right. to citizenship. If you're here illegally, if you owe allegiance to a foreign nation, if you're the citizen of a foreign country, that clause does not apply to you. If you read the debate about the ratification of the 14th Amendment, all the senators who are discussing what this is meant to do and what it means are very clear on this point. I tried to point that out. I expected the left would blow up and get angry, which they did. Uh, what I didn't expect, at least not to this extent, and what was very disappointing, was how angry the so-called conservative intellectuals got with me. And they essentially said, any opposition to birthright citizenship is, is racist and evil and un-American. And you know, I'm still in the middle of this debate, writing back and forth. It'll go on for a while. I'm happy to do it. I'm a happy warrior on these questions. But it shows you, you know, you asked the speaker, 
why are the uh, Republicans so bad on this question? He gave you some answers. I ask a parallel question. Why are the so-called conservatives, the intellectuals, the conservative scholars so bad on this question? That's one of the things I'm trying to point about out. The, 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 the nonprofit people who've been consuming billions of yes, donations for right. 40 years as the country gets more liberal and then yes. lecture people like you that you're sort of not towing right. their line. It's a deeply unimpressive group. Deeply uh, unimpressive group. I'm I talking would ignore about them the, if I were you. Oh, I know Go who ahead. you're talking about. No, I'm talking about the uh, writers so, but, and the think tank scholars. Oh, I'm very aware of exactly yeah. what you're talking about. But, but let, let me ask you this. So the people who wrote the 14th Amendment did not envision a moment where, I don't know, thousands of Chinese would fly to Saipan, have their children there so they could become yeah. U.S. citizens, or people would sneak in illegally into this country so their kids would get American benefits. That wasn't kind of no. a consideration for the, the The purpose of the 14th Amendment was to settle the question of the citizenship of freed black slaves. So this is right after the Civil War, and you have some people in the country citing the Dred Scott decision, widely re regarded as the worst Supreme Court decision ever, which held that no black yes. person could ever be a citizen. And the Congress said, we're going to overturn that forever and make it clear that if you were born here and you're subject to the jurisdiction, as all freed slaves were, then you are a citizen and no state can take that away from you. They, they they also make it clear in language in the debates and in the Civil Rights Act of 1866, passed the same year as this debate by the same Congress, that yeah. you have to be not subject to any foreign power in order to be eligible for birthright citizenship. And all the people attacking me and freaking out about this, they don't really have an answer to that. They just glide past it no, and try to no. obfuscate and point to other other things that aren't relevant. If you read the debate, it's very clear what the framers of that amendment meant. Well, because for them, it's theology. It's, it's not a policy debate, and you violated a tenet of their religion. And I hope you'll continue to do that uh, fearlessly as you have. Michael, thank Believe you. Me. Good for you. Thank you. Good for you. Enrique Acevedo is an anchor at Univision and interested in the topic of immigration. He joins us tonight. Uh, so, Enrique, I'm sure you heard that. It's a very interesting uh, point, I thought, that Michael Anton made that the 14th Amendment was never envisioned. Uh, to give birthright citizenship to the children of people who are breaking our laws, just not in here illegally. But leaving the legal debate aside, why as a matter of common sense does the United States owe citizenship and all the benefits and privileges that come with it to the children of people who sneak in here in order to have their kids here? Why would we ever go along with that? Well, first of all, I don't think they sneak in here to have their kids receive citizenship. Yes, they do, ask, actually. Yes, they, a lot of people do. What you, immigrants, the reasons Please. why they come to the U.S. having their kids uh, being citizens is not on that list. The, the reasons why they come to this country well, that, do that's not include factually citizenship for their, for their kids. But, you know. Oh, really? They, they oh, they really? Say, because I, if I'm, your child not, is... A, wait, well, hold on. Wait a second. That's not, that's not true. So you're saying that nobody comes into this country to have their kids here in order to make sure their kids are citizens. Why don't you ask anybody who works in a hospital in, say, Brownsville, Texas, if that's true? And they'll laugh no, at you. No, I didn't say, I didn't say everyone. I, there are a lot of people who abuse the 14th Amendment. There are a lot of people who come from right. Russia, from uh, China, for example. There's a exactly. lot of tourism that's, that's right. focused on having, on having that. And, and exactly. You know, it, it, wouldn't be, it would be disingenuous of me not to recognize that. But you're saying that undocumented immigrants come to this country to give their kids citizenship. And that's just not, I, I'm not, not the saying case. that. I'm, I'm saying that it happens a lot. And, and But why would we go along with that? Why are the rest of us bullied? People like you get up and say, you're racist if you're not. Okay, spare me. Well, honestly, why is that good for us? Why would we allow that? Why are we going along with this? I guess is you know, my Tucker, question. I'm not going to fall into the trap of calling everyone advocating for the end of birthright citizenship a uh, ethno-nationalist or even a racist, although there's something to be said about that in many cases. But, you know, this is a complex issue. It's harder to defend birthright citizenship than it is to get behind uh, those who call for, for the end of it. I would just say, you know, there's no perfect immigration system. We chose to give birthright citizenship in this country. And I would tell everyone at home to imagine what the U.S. would look like, what America would look like today, without birthright citizenship. At some point, someone well, in our so family was, was first to, to immigrate to this country, and their children became citizens through that right. You either have right, blood but, but or how birthright about this? citizenship. How about this? That no, but look, I'm not calling for an end to immigration, though I'm starting to think we should pause it, because it's making our country too volatile, but a separate conversation. But let me ask you this. Why would we ever grant citizenship to the children of someone here illegally? You're breaking our laws. And we're rewarding you by giving what we consider this valuable thing, citizenship, to your to your offspring. Why would we do that? Couldn't we just say, well, if you're here illegally, the birthright citizenship does not apply to your offspring? 
Fair? There are many arguments. First of all, I would say, I would argue that it helps with integration. When someone in the family becomes a U.S. citizen, it helps with integration for the whole family and the community. Uh, you know, that's that's something that really? people should uh, to pay attention to. Also, the fact that you know many so people argue wait, that oh, that's, that's a fair that's purpose. a fair point. But let, let me ask you: the, the, we, a survey came out yesterday that showed that 22 percent of all U.S. households do not speak English at home. That's not integration. That's balkanization. That's the opposite of integration. So if it helps, well, I don't know if, if this immigration a, scheme. You know, it, well, uh, it, it, integration. The only element in terms of is, integration, Spanish has, it's has the most important spoken by far. in places like New Mexico for centuries. That it's not about just language. Integration 22%, is about much more than that. Well, of course, yeah. no, no, no. Language is the key to culture. Anybody who pays five minutes of attention to this will tell you that a country in which people can't communicate by language is a disunited country. So. Do you think it's a good thing that 22% of Americans don't well, speak English at home? That's a bad thing, it's right? It's actually, it's an interesting, uh, it's an interesting statistic because most of those 22% are first generation immigrants. When you have their children who are actually U.S. citizens yes. because they were born here, the vast majority speaks English as their first language. And more and more, unfortunately, they're forgetting about Spanish. So, you know, I, I think it's it's interesting to say that it, it's why is a that, tool for why is integration. That un, why is that unfortunate? But wait, hold on. Why is that unfortunate? This is an English-speaking country. I, I, you know, why would it be yeah, unfortunate think, that people let go of a many, second language? Many languages is something that we, we should somehow f feel threatened about. I think it makes us, you know, more of aware of, feel of the world. Of, of the, no, and no. Plus, you, Spanish has you, been spoken in this country. Because language is culture, and you want a united centuries. culture, right? Because, as you know, half yeah. of this country was part of Mexico before it became the U.S., right? Half of this country was not part of Mexico, actually. That's factually untrue. But really quick, well, do, do you think that Arizona gives Mexico, Mexico right, that's not half Texas. the country. I, I, as a geography major, I can tell you. But very quick, do you think the fact that some of this belonged to the colonial, colonial Mexico, really Spain, actually, but does that give Mexico some right to send its poor people here, do you think? I don't think Mexico is sending anyone here. Actually, migration from Mexico is net zero. More people, more Mexicans are leaving the U.S. than those who are coming to this country. So, you know, I think that's also an important statistic when we, go, when we talk about immigration. Again, untrue. And just Again, untrue. one quick thing, because I heard yeah. what uh, Speaker uh, Very quick, said at the beginning of the show. Yeah. Oh, okay. Well, next time then. Enrique, thank you very much for joining us. Thank I you. appreciate it. Canada is dealing with its own immigration crisis, amazingly, and Prime Minister Trudeau has a plan, free hotels for immigrants. How do Canadian taxpayers who are not getting free hotels feel about that? We'll speak to one next. Tucker Carlson is brought to you by one... Former drama teacher turned Canadian Prime Minister Justin Trudeau has his own illegal immigration crisis north of the border. Border crossers are clogging the asylum system in Canada and flooding the homeless shelters. So the Canadian government has a new solution to all of this. Move hundreds of immigrants into hotels where they will live at public expense. Stephen LeDrew is a former president of the Liberal Party of Canada, and he joins us tonight for an update on all that. Stephen, thanks a lot for coming on. So I, be on Canadians are famously good humored and tolerant and, and sort of, I would say, a little bit passive maybe. But... Are they for this? Are, is anyone saying anything? Well, you're not. You're not passive. That's and we're no, glad to have I, you. I don't mean to. I love Canada. I'm not attacking Canada, but like, uh, what do they think well, of this? Come on, come on up for a holiday. We'll give you a free hotel room. Um, first of all, <laughs> the, the, the the 800 Tucker are just those who are now in in um, in school classrooms and in school uh, dormitories, and they have to be cleared out in order for the classes to come back towards the end of August. So those 800 are going to hotels. But that's only the thin edge of the wedge on this one because last year we had over 20,000 uh, illegal asylum in, um, seekers. This year, by the end of May, I think we had over 5,000. So there's thousands and thousands. And the mayors, particularly John Tory, the mayor of the city of Toronto, are saying we can no longer accommodate anybody. So the 800 going to hotel rooms, I hope it's not the Four Seasons or the Ritz, uh, but that is just a small number of them. So you ask about Canadians and how they're responding. Canadians are very generous. Uh, we have an empty country yes. up here. We could take a lot of people here, but on the other hand, they don't like to see their dollars uh, being wasted. So it comes around to the fact that these people seeking asylum, Tucker, and you know this, they aren't coming into the regular border places where they are processed. They are walking across, and uh, the government of Canada could stop that with just just uh, you know, a signature on a piece of paper. They could stop that for three months at least. 
uh, but they haven't done that. So Canadians are getting upset about this. On the other hand, they're also looking to the states and saying, well, why are all these people in the states and they're coming to Canada? Why aren't they staying in the states? They aren't being kicked out of the states. So that's a question for your Maybe president. it's because, well, maybe because Canada has more generous benefits and Canadians are even more well, guilty than Americans and feel. A, yeah, it is. It's much, it's much colder. So your prime minister, who I don't think really gets the credit he deserves for being a buffoon, no offense, um, is basically telling Canadians they're not allowed to complain about this. You're a bad person if you're against this, I think is his position. Well, he's saying that on a lot of matters. I mean, they, uh, he's been singing the same tune uh, since he's been in office, uh, talking about, you know, you know, gender equality and all kinds of stuff. He's had a lot of failures over the last year, and people are starting to, yes. uh, he's starting to wear thin. So I don't think the Tories, we're having a campaign, we're going to have an election, uh, Tucker, in uh, 14 months. They haven't started saying yet build the wall and make President Trump pay, as he's saying with Mexico. But it could come down right. to something like that because Trudeau is, in fact, saying not only on pipelines. I mean, we paid one of your Texas companies four point five billion with a B billion dollars. That may not be that much in the States and Canada is a lot of money. We paid them a pipeline that much for a pipeline out west because we couldn't get them to agree with all the terms of it and all kinds of other protesters. I mean, he is in you trouble. Know, I, meant, on... I meant to thank you for yep. that, by the way. Stephen, we're out of time, but I just want to thank you uh, for injecting that much out of into time? the American economy. <laughs> 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 it's great to see you, no. Stephen LeDrew from Canada. Good chatting as always. See ya. See you thank later. you. Well, more than a dozen states, you probably haven't been following this, but it happened, have passed laws allowing the government to take your guns away without a criminal conviction or a full hearing. Huh. Seems like it might violate your constitutional due process. No? We'll speak to someone who thinks it's a great idea. Next. The Bill of Rights gives every American the right to keep and bear arms, but in many states you can lose that right without a criminal conviction or a full court hearing. Amazingly, 13 U.S. states currently have so-called red flag laws. These laws allow private citizens to complain that an individual poses a gun violence threat. If a court agrees that person can lose his right to own a gun for weeks or even a year to get it back, that person has to prove that he deserves to have a gun. Igor Volsky is the director of Guns Down. He joins us tonight. Igor, thanks a lot for coming on. Thanks for having me. So nobody's for crazy people having guns, and I understand the idea behind this, but I think it's worth worrying about civil liberties because no one on the left does anymore, so it's left to us. The idea that you could lose a constitutional right, no one can test that the Second Amendment is real, without due process should bother all of us, right? I mean, can you, if you thought that someone was going to say something inciting violence, could you get an order to ban him from speaking? Would he lose his First Amendment right? I mean, how did, does this bother you at all? Yeah, it, I mean, it does in the sense of it really matters how you structure it. So in the way that it's been structured in the 13 states, if you pose an imminent threat, if somebody close to you or the police believe you pose an imminent threat, you go before a judge. You have to meet a certain standard of proof. That judge makes a determination. The judge also sets a court date that uh, that, that that is soon on the calendar. And then the person comes in and contests that right. And what we found in states like Connecticut and Indiana Tucker, where these laws have been challenged, is that they've been found to be constitutional because the processes and the safeguards that have been put in place have really passed that test. Well, wait, no, what's, what's passed the test is the American judicial system, which has been in place for hundreds of years. It works. I mean, there are, of course, times when it doesn't work and people are wrongly convicted or, or the guilty go free. But in general, we think the system works. That's why we have it. That's well, why yeah. it's and that's, you know, the also, that's so why every why not also, convict someone before taking his his constitutional rights away? Well, you know, what we've seen oftentimes, especially in cases of mass violence. So, for instance, 38 of the last 63 mass shooters ex express some kind of violent behavior before uh, taking before committing a mass shooting. And they had not yet committed a crime before that. So, uh, they're, you know, so so that that question of. If they had committed so a crime, if they had committed a felony, then yes. But the bar is so low right now, Tucker, federally. The bar is too low. And that's why you're seeing these individuals. Oh, so it's inconvenient to to convict someone before taking his rights away. So well, why look, bother? So, no, so what would happen? No, no, no. What would happen if a, if a relative said, I, I, you know, my daughter is a drug addict and she is not capable of making the decision to have an abortion. She can't think right. 
So a judge can swoop in without a trial and say you're not allowed to have an abortion. We're taking that right away. You know, Would you be I, okay with I, that? Well, hold on. I remember after Parkland in Vermont, uh, police found an individual, an 18-year-old, who had amassed weapons and wanted to commit mass murder in his school. Police used that state's uh, law that they had just passed to take those guns away from him because oh, they I'm clearly sure. determined that he was at risk. So there is a look, clear I, uh, situation. I, I believe I mean, that. That's no, no, where these look, orders I get are it. used, Tucker. No, no but, but that's what no, they no, That's no, why no, they've been effective. Really, they're, oh, they're that's used. Why they, well, that's oh, why so, they've been effective uh, okay. to but, prevent but hold murder. On, hold that's on. why they've been effective also to prevent uh, suicide. Because these are people at risk. Yeah, there's no doubt, I'm sure, that it's effective. The question is, do we care? And again, no one on the left, including Look, you, cares about civil liberties anymore. I, Tucker, I but don't let me, know why That's you why you that. won't answer my I, question. I, I just, say that because I, you're making a case you against through, due process. I that's you why. you through the structure no, no, of these you laws expo hold that hold judges have upheld. But that's not that's due process. Really, so do you worry? Let me ask you this. And I Tucker, bet you don't worry about this. If there are due process well, let me, challenges let me ask you a, let me ask you a question, let, let Igor. Okay, bring those please. challenges the and then the ACLU is challenging. Well, please great, don't speak over the, the ACLU will is challenging that. But let me ask you this. You're not worried at all that this will be, as the ACLU has suggested, disproportionately used against African Americans. You say, oh, I think that person's in a gang. I think he has a gun. He looks dangerous. The judge is like, yeah, that's right. I'm taking it away. You well, don't think you, know, you think the justice system is racist. You've said that many times. So you're going to let that system without due process take a constitutional right away from people. And you don't think that that's going to be used disproportionately against African-Americans? Seriously? Well, look, we have to make sure that doesn't happen. But what we've seen in the states. Really, that how are we going to make sure that doesn't happen? A state like Connecticut. Well, how are we going to make sure that doesn't happen? Since 1999, they haven't found that kind of racial disparity. And that's and that's a good but thing. How actually. are we going to. But think, you say the system is racist. It, how are we going to make sure that doesn't happen? happen well tucker i mean you know oh, you don't have an answer because <laughs> you don't care okay tucker okay. you know just what checking I, what i'm happy about okay. listen what i'm happy right. about is that this is i'll give you the last word one sentence this is a bipartisan idea for republican governors support this and oh, this is something we can get behind some republicans for this it. is I something we can get behind the both on the left and the right to really limit Igor, gun violence I'm not bipartisanship here tucker right. thank you good thank to see you, you. It's not just the government who threatens your rights today, of course. Big tech companies are doing their part to stifle free speech, and they're doing a very good job. That's next. Well, the tech industry used to describe itself as a citadel of free speech. It was all about freedom. But of course, that is no longer true. That reputation is safely dead and buried. A new vice investigation has exposed shadow bans on conservative accounts at Twitter, while Google-owned YouTube recently removed several videos purely for their political content. It's not the first time they've done that. It's common. Brett Larson hosts Fox News Headlines 24-7. He joins us with more on those stories. Hey, Brett. Hey, Tucker. Good to see you. It uh, was definitely a one-two punch of problems for social media giant Facebook today. The problem started with a disappointing earnings call on Wednesday. Facebook admitted that a combination of privacy concerns and new personal data handling rules that went into effect in the European Union resulted in a loss of a few million users and worse, the ability to target ads as precisely as they could just a few months ago. Now, you mix that in with the simmering worries of users here in the US following the Cambridge Analytica scandal and the wind has blown the house of cards down. $100 billion down, actually, today. In fact, the stock drop is the largest drop in value in Wall Street history. Facebook stock closed down 19%, its lowest in nearly three months. Now, a little further up the peninsula in San Francisco, Twitter also dealing with some bad news. Vice News reported that Twitter was shadow banning some prominent Republicans. Basically, what that means is when you searched for users like Congressman Jim Jordan or GOP Chairwoman Ronna McDaniel, McDaniel rather, their names didn't auto-populate, which limits their reach. Now, Twitter quickly fixed it and said the users were mistakenly caught in a troll trap an attempt to clean up the discourse on the platform by improving what Twitter calls conversation health to limit the reach of troll-like behaviors. And citing community standards, YouTube yanked three videos from Alex Jones' Infowars, one of which alleges to show a man pushing a child to the ground. Infowars says the videos could have simply been labeled mature content, but YouTube has had a contentious relationship with Infowars this year penalizing them earlier in the year when host Alex Jones suggested the survivors of the Parkland school shooting 
were reading scripted lines. And now, social media sites have been struggling to automate the process of moderating conversations, blocking bullies, and flushing fake news. And the results aren't always a benefit to some conservative voices. Tucker? Yes, there is. Brett Larson, thanks a lot for that. Thanks, I appreciate Tucker. it. Charlie Hurd is opinion editor at the Washington Times, and he joins us tonight. Charlie, great to see you. Great to see you, Tucker. So I couldn't help notice, so the, the big story in Washington today is that Caitlin Collins over at CNN uh, was prevented from covering an event at the White House yesterday. And Caitlin worked for me for years. Uh, she's a fair and decent person, and I don't think she should have been prevented from covering anything. Uh, that, that's my position on that. So, but CNN has been basically a martyr for free speech for the last 24 hours. <laughs> at the same time, they're telling us how important it is that people should be able to say what they think. They are agitating for Alex Jones to be pulled off YouTube. Now, I know we're supposed to think that Alex Jones is way more radical than like Bill Maher, or Michelle Wolf, or Rosie O'Donnell, but he's got a point of view, and CNN is trying to squelch his point of view. What do you make of that? Yeah, you know, I'm all in favor of CNN getting all the access uh, that it wants to the White House. I want yeah, all reporters to get all the access that they want uh, at the White House. Me too. But you're right. The hypocrisy is just astounding. And I guarantee you that if you flipped over to CNN right now, there would not be a single story about the Twitter shadow banning. There would not be a single story. And the only story you would see about YouTube pulling Alex Jones videos would be probably something celebratory uh, about, uh, you know, a, a, a scalp of sort of sorts uh, for for, for managing to uh, eventually get their way on that story. And, and you know, I, I look at, at um, all of the, the uh, consternation about Donald Trump and, and this White House, but, you know, my goodness, this has been going on for absolutely ever. You, you know how uh, the White House press shop works. Um, you know, at, at press conferences, the president always uh, picks who he wants to, uh, to ask him questions. Often the, the staffers go around and talk to the reporter beforehand. It's almost, as far as I'm concerned, it's the same as planting, uh, planting questions because you're, you're basically setting who it is that's going to ask you a question. So, you know, all of these concerns right. suddenly about uh, uh, access and free speech at the White House, come on. I mean, there's so many problems in, in, uh, with the White House press corps to begin with. Uh, that, uh, you know, you, you never hear any of that. I've never heard this level right. of consternation before now. I wish the left still defended free speech. Yeah, no kidding. Charlie Hurt, who does relentlessly defend free speech. Great to see you. Great to see you, Tucker. Time for final exam. Question is, can you beat our experts at remembering what happened in the past week? It's a good one this week. We'll be right back. Time now for Final Exam, where we comb the nation in search of the two most erudite people we can find to see who remembers what happened this week. Joining us, Katie Patworth of Town Hall. She's won six weeks in a row. Tonight she goes for her seventh win. Her challenger this week is former Trump advisor, Fox News contributor, and author of the upcoming book, Why We Fight, Dr. Sebastian Gorka. We meet again, Dr. Gorka. Greetings. Great to see you both. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Who's intimidating? Are you, you guys are bringing I, the big I, guns in. I, said I know you are rarely nervous. But I are you said nervous if, now? If, if we're head to head, we're going to arm wrestle this lady, okay? <laughs> <laughs> okay. She's, she's stronger than she looks. All right. I know you know the rules, but I'm going to repeat them for the sake of our viewers at home. Here they are. Hands on buzzers. I ask the questions. The first one to buzz in gets to answer the question. You have to wait until I finish asking the question in order to answer it. You can answer once I acknowledge by saying your name. Each correct answer is worth one point. If you get it wrong, you lose a point. The best of five wins. Are you ready? Ready. Ready. Outstanding. Question one. This is multiple choice. Please listen carefully. Scientists have just discovered something extraordinary on Mars, the planet. The thing they found is very cold, very salty, and raises the potential that alien life exists there. Is it A? A large rock in the shape of a man. B, a vast underwater lake. C, an ancient packet of peanuts. B. Katie Pavlich. B, you say, a vast underwater lake. Is it a vast underwater lake? I was rooting for peanuts. We'll see to the table. <laughs> Scientists say they discovered liquid water on Mars. The water was found in a lake deep under the Martian South Pole. The lake that they found is 12 Aliens. miles wide and one mile beneath the frigid surface. There are hopes that where there's water, there could be life. It is indeed the lake. B, Kitty Pavlich takes the lead. Question two, Dr. Gorka. 
prepare yourself. There's a man running for mayor in the city of Chicago. His name is Willie Wilson, not Willie Nelson, the country music singer. This Willie Wilson is under a lot of scrutiny right now because he was spotted in church recently handing out what to potential voters? Dr. Cash. Gorka. Cash. Ca I don't think that's legal, but we're going to check the tape and see if you're right. God bless you, Dr. Wilson. Will in cash. Wilson wow. says it's part of his Literally annual effort votes. to help people Amazing. pay their skyrocketing property taxes and not a blatant vote buying scheme. <laughs> but charity. not a blatant vote buying scheme. <laughs> right. You are right, Sebastian Gorka. Pulls right. even with reigning champion Katie Pavlich into question three, which is this. Which former attorney general of the United States says he wants to be president of the United States, but he will not decide until next year whether or not to run? Oh, damn it. Dr. Gorka. Slime ball number one, Eric Holder. <laughs> Slime ball number one, Eric Holder. <laughs> Roll the tape. He's right. Is it Eric Holder? Are you seriously considering throwing your hat into the ring for 2020? Yeah, and I'm thinking about it. And what I've it. said is that um, I'd make a determination sometime early next year. I was just looking to see potential contributors, you know. <laughs> Slime ball number one, it is Eric Holder. <laughs> Point to you, Dr. Gorka. Two to one, going into question four, which is. Earlier this week, a United States senator had to reassure the public that he was still alive. Reports from Google and Wikipedia suggested otherwise. They said that he had died last year. Which senator was it? Senator Orrin Hatch Katie of Pavlich. Utah. Senator Orrin, Orrin Hatch, Hatch of, Utah. of Utah, standing upright. Is it Orrin Hatch? Staffers for Senator Orrin Hatch tweeting, Hi Google, we might need to talk with a screenshot of Google search results which claimed he passed away last year. His team then posting a series of photos proving the senator is very much alive. <laughs> oh, and you are correct, which brings us to question five. In a sudden death match between Dr. Sebastian Gorka and Katie Pavlich. Final question. This again is multiple choice. There is a video from England, an island on which Dr. Rook grew up, and it is all over the internet today. It shows a tourist getting in the way of one of the Queen's guards while the guard is marching outside of Windsor Castle. How did the guard react to the tourist? Did he A, ask her politely to move out of the way, B, push her really hard to the side, or C, lock her up in prison in the Queen's Tower? <sighs> Dr. Gorka. I'm going for A, Tucker. A, did he politely ask her to move out of the way? To the tape we go. It was B. Ooh. Your Waterloo, I'm afraid, Dr. Gorka. That would Katie not Pavlich have happened in my time. Force. <laughs> that was, that's a good point. Get back to Great Britain. Teach them, <laughs> teach them what you know. Th thank you both. And Katie Pavlich, you have the mug big enough for a massive dinner yeah. party. This is, of course, thank our commemorative we are going Eric to have a party Wemple with all the Fear and Terror mug. You yes, ought to. We are going to. Sebastian we're going Gorka, to document it on social congratulations. Media for sure. Thank you very Thank much. You Getting as far as you Good did. Game. Saluting you. <laughs> Barely. Yeah. And we should we should note, by the way, that our scorekeepers are telling me that Katie Pavlich is one win away from the all-time final exam record, of course, set by Shannon Bream earlier in the year. If she meets that, it is possible we could have a competition of champions in the works, but we will see. That's next week. Thank you both. On CTV. Pay attention Thanks, to the Tucker. news. Yeah. Oh, see big time. <laughs> Tune in every week, mostly Thursdays, to see if you can outwit the experts. Follow the news. You can win. We'll be right back. Work hard to protect because the government has put them so deeply in debt with student loans. But it turns out that making everything free is expensive. It raises the question of who's going to pay for it all. Kevin Phillips of Campus Reform visited a campus recently to get that question answered. Here's part of what he found. I feel like everyone should have, like, um, free um, education and health care. How are we going to pay for this? Oh, God. I mean... Us. Us, I guess. Yeah. Who, in your mind, should pay for all of the free things? 
all the free things? Well, some of it should come from taxes, but the government should pay for it. But the government is funded by taxes. Yeah. I don't know where the money would come from, but they can figure it out. Okay. <laughs> the people with a good idea and a good reason to spend their tax money wouldn't mind actually paying more taxes. Kevin yeah, Phillips joins us tonight. They can figure it out. That seemed to sum up a lot of the responses you got. That is exactly what happened. These were all people in Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez's district, I might add. Uh, and I think it's, it's easy to laugh along and get caught up in seeing how funny it is, but it's ultimately not a laughing matter. Uh, just how popular socialism has become, millennials who are the most likely to support it are now the largest voting bloc in America. And millions of them are graduating college every year with a warped perception of reality. I think that's where this starts is college campuses. I've been on about 50 college campuses in the past year with the Leadership Institute's campus reform. They all have one thing in common, and that's that socialism is viewed as highbrow. It's viewed as compassionate. And if you dare support capitalism or free markets, you're evil. You don't care about poor people. And I think the left is winning the messaging battle right now by teaching people that socialism is tolerant. And it's, it's not actually in line with what history has shown as socialism really is. Yeah. Well, this is what the finance economy has brought us. Yeah. Kevin Phillips, thanks for that report. Great to see you. Thanks for having me. We're sadly out of time. Tune in every night at 8 to the show that's the sworn enemy of lying, pomposity, smugness, and group. Thanks, Sean Hannity. Right. Good evening and welcome to Tucker Carlson tonight. For more than 100 years, the Democratic Party was organized around the interests of ordinary Americans. Democrats ran campaigns on things like higher wages, better working conditions against the banks that crushed their voters with debt. A lot of Democratic ideas didn't always work. Some were silly, but their focus was always clear. American citizens were the party's priority, and that is no longer the case. To the modern Democratic Party, Americans are an afterthought. Try to find a Democrat running this year, for example, on the opioid crisis or high energy prices, the collapse of public schools, the decline of the middle class. Hard to find one. Democrats are bored by these topics. What interests them is power. In order to win and maintain power, Democrats understand they need reliable new voters, voters who will support them obediently without making difficult demands like a higher standard of living. That's why the Democratic Party suddenly supports open borders so fervently. Immigration is really the only issue that matters to them because packing the electorate is the only way they can regain control of this country. Their goal is clear, and they will do or say anything to achieve it. Here, for example, is the governor of New York likening the Trump administration to Islamic terrorists for the crime of daring to enforce federal immigration law. Watch. They are on a jihad to deport as many people as they can who they believe are not in the United States legally who they believe are not in the United States legally. Pretty easy to determine whether someone's here legally or not. And it wasn't that long ago that leading Democrats like Bill Clinton, for example, argued in public that our country should deport illegal immigrants. They're here illegally, after all. They're breaking our law. Now, Democrats claim that non-citizens, even illegal ones, have a right to vote in our elections. That is happening in San Francisco and in parts of the state of Maryland. By the 2020 election, it'll be happening in many other places. That's guaranteed. Now, you'd think congressional Republicans would be upset about this. Allowing illegals to occupy and run our country makes a mockery of citizenship. It's terrible for America, and it's a death sentence for the Republican Party. But nope, Republicans on the Hill seem okay with this. Here's one example. In 2014, the Obama administration changed the rules so that Anybody claiming a threat from gang violence or domestic abuse could get asylum in the United States. The effect was to allow pretty much anybody to permanently enter this country, provided they supplied the right story. And many, many did. Of course, that was precisely the point, to open the borders without saying so. Well, earlier this summer, Attorney General Jeff Sessions reversed the Obama rule. Now House Republicans somehow, for some reason, are teaming up with Democrats to stop Sessions from doing that. Just yesterday, they tacked an amendment onto an appropriations bill in the House that would preserve the asylum rights of anybody who claims to be fleeing gang violence. That change would nullify any effort to secure our southern border. Mexico and Central America have plenty of gang violence. Now, all 150 million people who live there can cite that fact as justification to move here legally and stay permanently. When they get here, they'll find Democrats eager to give them the right to vote. House Republicans could stop this. They're not even trying. 
One person who thinks Republicans ought to care about this issue is former House Speaker Newt Gingrich. He just wrote a piece about the left's plan to win through non-citizen voting. We spoke with him just a short time ago. Here's what he said. Mr. Speaker, thanks for joining us tonight. You've argued that the entire point of the Democrats' immigration policy is to increase their electoral share. How do you think this works? Well, it's pretty straightforward. Uh, they think they get the vast majority of votes from illegal immigrants in San Francisco. They've now made it possible to vote without being a citizen. Uh, there are other places around the country where Democrats are advocating that they allow people who are not here legally or people who have not yet become citizens to vote. And I think they think their calculus is that uh, they have a harder time winning an election with law-abiding Americans. And so the more people they can bring in who don't know American history, don't understand the Constitution, aren't part of uh, our traditional values, the better off their chances are. I think that's why every single Democratic senator co-sponsored Senator Feinstein's open border bill, which would literally have opened the border to virtually everybody in the world uh, to come to America. When you were speaker, there are about 22 million foreign born people in the United States. That number is now about double. Republicans have controlled the Congress for a lot of that time. Even today, Republicans on the Hill are trying to undo the attorney gen one of the attorney general's efforts to, to tighten the border. Why don't Republicans on the Hill understand the threat that these policies pose to the country and to them? I frankly don't I don't get it. I mean, let's let's start with sanctuary cities, which is the most popular position uh, that President Trump has. Eighty four percent of the country, have, eight out of every 10 Americans believes that sanctuary cities increase the risk of crime. Now, that should be pretty easy for Republicans and frankly, for common sense Democrats to unify around in terms of establishing a public policy. But I think part of what's happened is you have the constant drumbeat of the liberal media uh, which intimidates some Republicans who, who forget, and I re recently wrote a paper on this, um, the weakest Republican position on immigration is 60 percent. That's absolute control of the border. The strongest is 84 percent. That's closing down all the sanctuary cities, and in the case of California, closing down the sanctuary state. Yet Republicans often behave as though they represent a minority interest when, in fact, even most people who are here as, as, as immigrants